In this section, we'll discuss uh, the central force problem in the case that we have gravitational forces. So we're thinking now here of gravitational forces, and this gives rise to what's called uh, Keplerian orbits. Coming back to our dynamical equation, which we've now written, remember, as u, uh, for u as a function of phi, second derivative of u with respect to phi is equal to minus u of phi, whatever that function is, minus uh, a constant here, uh, the reduced mass over the angular momentum squared for the orbit, divided through by u squared, again, that function we have yet to solve for, and then times the force function, whatever the force function is. So in the case of gravity, of course, the force function uh, is g times the product of two, two masses, divided through by the radial distance between the masses squared. And so if we convert uh, g, m, m, g, m, 1, m, 2 into a constant gamma, we can rewrite r 1 over r squared as just u squared. And so then when we plug this into our equation up here, we get this uh, as a second order differential equation for u uh, as a function of phi. And it turns out we can solve this pretty easily. Okay, so calling u double prime, that's our second phi derivative, and taking the u uh, to the left-hand side, we find that u double prime plus u, that's just equal to this constant. This looks a lot like our harmonic oscillator, and now we just have to deal with the fact that we have a constant over here. Well, if we assume a solution of the form u of phi is equal to a cosine of phi minus delta, where delta is some as-yet-determined uh, angle, plus... The constant, what we find is that this solution for u as a function of phi exactly satisfies uh, this differential equation. And so u as a function of phi uh, looks like this right here. It's just basically oscillating um, around uh, of the uh, constant value u mu over L squared. And so we have uh, for our u of phi an oscillatory solution. So the next step is that we need to go in and replace all of our u's with r's. We need to turn this back into an equation for r because remember r is the radial distance between the two uh, gravitating bodies. That's really the parameter we're interested in solving for. Okay, so coming back to our uh, solution u of phi, we find that we can rewrite u of phi as uh, this constant up front times 1 plus epsilon times cos phi. If we assume, if we define a new constant epsilon to be that, and if we assume that we're going to measure phi uh, with delta equals zero. So basically we can choose to measure our angle phi, the angle of revolution for our system, uh, with respect to any axis we like. So we may as well choose an axis where that uh, initial value delta uh, is zero. And so that means uh, we get a, a simpler expression for u as a function of phi. We can define a new constant, uh, c, which is the inverse of all of this business. And it turns out, we won't show it here, but it turns out that... Uh, the units for c are actually length. If you actually plug in uh, your gravitational constants and the uh, reduced mass and then an angular momentum, what you'll find is that c has a units of length. And so then we get a solution for u, which remember is 1 over r, that's c to the minus 1 times 1 plus epsilon cos phi. And then solving for r, what we find is that r as a function of phi is c over 1 plus epsilon cosine phi. And this turns out to be the equation for a conic section, in other words, for a Keplerian orbit. But it has uh, qualitatively different behavior in different regimes, depending on, actually, depending on the value for epsilon. And so let's look at a couple of different examples to understand the different qualitative behaviors. So we think about C over R. So now what we're thinking of is uh, this expression here. If we want to know how that behaves, let's consider the case that epsilon is less than 1. So we're taking an epsilon which is less than 1. In that case, what we find is a plot that looks like this. When uh, phi is 0, c over r, that's going to be 1 plus epsilon. So that's going to be a maximum. And then for, uh, for phi equal pi over 2, in other words, when cosine of, excuse me, when, when phi is pi, uh, cosine of phi, of course, will be negative 1. And then c over r, that goes to a minimum uh, 1 minus epsilon. And so basically, c over r oscillates back and forth like this for epsilon less than 1. And so if we flip this over, so we're solving for r, what we find is the minimum value that r will take on over the course of a Keplerian orbit is c 
divided by 1 plus epsilon. So when, when the, the denominator is at a maximum, that's the minimum value for the radial distance between the two masses. And then when uh, uh, cosine of phi is at its minimum, that's when the denominator becomes a minimum, 1 minus epsilon, and so you take on r max. It's the maximum radial distance from uh, between the two masses. And we'll walk through it here, but this relationship between r and the angle phi actually describes an elliptical orbit when epsilon is less than 1. And so here, for example, is our ellipse. You can see that phi, in this case, uh, measures uh, the angle uh, of one of the masses relative to the x-axis here. So here's phi, the radial distance at any point in the orbit, of course, is shown by this vector here. Uh, as the objects revolve around one another, um, the distance between them goes from r min all the way out to r max. So when the objects are uh, a distance r min away from one another, that's called the pericenter, the closest point uh, in the orbit, when the radial distance between the two objects is r max, that's called the apocenter. That's when the two objects are as far apart as it can be. Um, I'm not going to discuss all the details of uh, elliptical geometry, but here uh, we have two important quantities that describe the shape of the ellipse. One of them is called the semi-major axis A, and that turns out to be equal to the uh, constant C divided by 1 minus epsilon squared. Now keep in mind, this is the distance from uh, the farthest point on the ellipse to the middle of the ellipse, not to the focus of the ellipse here. So this is basically A here. The semi-minor axis, that's uh, the distance from, say, here down to the, to the center of the ellipse, and that's given by C over square root of 1 minus epsilon squared. And so as, as you can see, you can combine A and B to actually calculate the value epsilon. Epsilon is called the eccentricity. You can see that if epsilon is zero, if epsilon is zero, then the r min and r max for our elliptical orbit, those will be equal to one another. In other words, we'll have a circular orbit. So when the epsilon, the eccentricity, is equal to zero, that's actually a circular orbit. And for an elliptical orbit, which is bound, uh, epsilon goes from a value bigger than zero all the way up to a value one. The bigger epsilon gets until it reaches one, that tells us how stretched out our ellipse is, basically how big a difference we get between r max and r min. So the bigger epsilon gets, the bigger the difference between r min and r max, and the more and more stretched out our elliptical orbit gets.